Thank you very much, Dustin. And I wanted to make sure that we called you out specifically for all the great work you're doing to organize this panel to the captioner who's about to help capture the captioning because this is so important for accessibility and to Jolly for the live stream. So a quick thank you in advance. Well, we have an amazing group of humans here today to speak to you about making sure we're all online. And as we know, during the pandemic, the internet has been our lifeline. How do we get 100% of the humans around the planet and in the United States um, and close the online and close the internet access gap once and for all? Um, for those of you that don't know me, I've been working in the access and the connectivity space, uh, both from the private sector side, the government side, the nonprofit side for over 20 years. It has been um, a preoccupation of mine to see people get connected and that's part of what we do at the Internet Society. And what we have before you today is a fabulous group of panelists. We've got Michelle Connolly, who's a professor of the practice at Economics Department of Duke University. You can see her full bio on the Internet Governance Forum USA landing page. Alonzo Melendez, who's the Digital um, Equity and Inclusion Coordinator for the Multonoma, if I'm going to pronounce that wrong, <laughs> Alonzo, help me later. Alonzo Melendez. Sonia George from the um, Alliance for Affordable Internet. She's the Executive Director. And Donald Cravens, who's the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for the National Urban League. Um, the way this panel will work is that I'm going to ask some intro questions to um, our panelists. And I'm going to start with Alonzo and move to Michelle and Sonia and Donald. So um, for those of you that are just joining us, um, get ready for a great inter, um, interaction with some super people who are spending their lives working on connectivity issues. Alonzo, you are working at the local level and we're trying to frame this conversation for the people watching here at IGF USA about the local, the regional, the global perspectives on connectivity, the issues related to affordability and to digital equity and inclusion, the economics, the financing. All of you are involved in that. And Alonzo, you're really involved at that local level. Libraries around the world have been anchor institutions for connectivity, not only in the United States, but globally. And many of us work with those institutions. Help us understand from your perspective what happened during the pandemic from the library side and what you do generally um, to help with digital equity, inclusion, and connectivity from that very local, important uh, execution style, uh, practical perspective to connect people. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. So yeah, the library, so pre-pandemic, I'm gonna start pre-pandemic. We, we would, we host about 2 million internet um, sessions a year. So that's, that's a lot of people coming to the library to use the internet. And, you know, I, I think that the library has always been a place for access, right? And we moved to really, well, and I could really speak for Mon Monoma. It's so it's Multnomah, just if you're wondering. Multnomah County Library, you know, what we've really done is try to be equitable with our services and making sure that folks are aware of what we have, of the services and resources we have and doing our best to make everyone feel welcome and invited to the library to access those resources. Uh, and even within those efforts, we still find that there are, are communities of color that don't see the library as a place for them. So, you know, we're still working on that. We're, we're you know, definitely making some, some movement, but it, it's, it, it, there's still a stigma associated with libraries and who libraries are for. Um, so, during the pandemic, what we've done and what, you know, I, I so again, I'm going to speak mostly from one county library, but I did do some research what other libraries were doing. And I could say that there have been libraries that stayed open in some capacity during the pandemic. And they had limited capacity uh, for people to come in, to use computers, to get online. They had very limited capacity to provide one-on-one -on -one support for people that needed that tech support folks that didn't know how to use computers or technology or know how to navigate a website. So that was greatly reduced due to the pandemic. And really the pandemic kind of just highlighted the need for access to internet, computers, and training. And in, in, when it comes to training, there, there's different things that need to be considered for that training to be successful, for it to be beneficial and effective for people. And you know, really thinking about adult learners, English language learners, and just different levels of, of education or literacy that we need to consider when we're trying to develop training. 
And then, of course, there's also accessibility issues, mobility issues. What kind of limitations do people have physically to be able to access and, and uh, be successful with training? So there's a lot of things that kind of go, go into what we're trying to do. What Multnomah County Library has done is we kind of started late in the game in terms of trying to provide services to people and access to internet and computers during the pandemic. There was a lot of concern, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. And so we wanted to be strategic. We wanted to be safe, as safe as possible uh, to bring people into the libraries or to access our services. So about, well, let me see, when was it? It was back in October, we developed a program to get a, a tech lending program, which would provide computers and hotspots to people to use at their home. And that, that went pretty well. I mean, we got some funding through the CARES Act and we had some funding already um, from the Library Foundation. And we used that money to buy 500 hotspots, 500 Chromebooks, and we began lending those out through community organizations. But we wanted to be strategic about ensuring that these got into the hands of people that have little to no access. So, you know, thinking about people who are low income, people that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, thinking of those already marginalized communities. And so it started with a small group of people doing the work and kind of grew a little bit in, let's see, it was in March, in March of this year, I took that program and started actually going out to the community doing outreach events where we provided mobile computer labs. So really kind of giving people access in the community to um, be able to get online, to use a computer and to have that one-on-one -on -one tech support. So that's something more recent that we've been doing. Um, yeah, did I answer the question? You absolutely answered the question. And it's amazing to see that during a pandemic, you've, you've created a tech lending program, which I think is something that probably is going to last past the pandemic. I would bet there's probably demand in your community for not only training, but just inclusion. Yeah, to feel like that there's, there's a group there looking at them at that local level to help them get online, to access connectivity. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, we, it started as a pilot program. It's, it's now a permanent program. We're going to continue this. We actually just um, applied for another grant to get some more Chromebooks some more hotspots to try to continue to expand this program and really get people connected. You know, in many states and many cities, there's, there's groups of people, pockets that don't have internet, can't afford internet. You know, we. And so it, it's really something that we can't say, oh, okay, the pandemic's you know, over, we're almost over, we don't have to continue this. No, we do have to continue this. And another thing that we're moving, uh, another direction that we're moving in is trying to make these programs accessible to people, again, in the community, but also during times that they're available, not when we're available to provide it, but when they're available to access it. So really thinking of, of working families, thinking of you know, moms with children, and trying to provide these, um, these mobile computer labs in, in places and areas for people that, and during times that people could actually access them. So actually later in the evenings. This is really interesting from the demand side. And I'm gonna shift over to Michelle, who knows more about demand side issues than I do. <laughs> um, but Michelle, and then we'll turn to Don after Michelle. Michelle, with the work that you're doing and the, the money that we're seeing out there in the community, Alonzo's given us a, a heads up that they got some of the CARES Act money. We're seeing millions and billions going into infrastructure in Washington, D.C., where I am. Um, and uh, the Senate and the House are talking about what to do with the money on infrastructure on that side. Alonzo's um, shown us that there's demand in local communities, probably latent demand that we're not seeing. And it's not just there. It's probably around the world. Talk to us about what you're seeing on the money side, on how on the financing and the economics um, from your perspective with respect to how do we get more people online? How do we make this more affordable? How do we make this sustainable? Because sustainability is so critical. We can't just be looking at money going somewhere and not having accountability. So let us know what you're thinking and seeing. This would be really helpful to this conversation. Okay, so I think they're kind of two dimensions when we talk of, or when you ask about money. I mean, one is uh, there's discussion of where there's investment in broadband and how that affects access. And, and so that's one discussion. Another discussion is then how do, pri how do prices affect demand or affect affordability and things like that. And, and those are, are in some ways two different discussions on the, um, 
on how money affects kind of uh, access, well, I shouldn't say accessibility, but the provision of broadband. I mean, we, we've, we've really uh, greatly increased the provision of broadband throughout the United States. So literal access is, is less of an issue, much less of an issue than it was, it was five years ago even. Um, and I think, so now a lot of the discussion is more about uh, the digital divide in the sense of even if there is access, why are we still seeing a digital divide and why is this not come, you know, why are not, are things not improving on that side? And um, what I have seen from other people's research and from what I've looked at some of uh, census data on this is what's surprising is, is there clearly uh, traditional factors that one would expect such as income levels or education. Um, do play a role, but things like age or presence of children, um, these things dwarf the impacts of other things, of, of other factors that we're talking more about. And, uh, you know, listening to, to, to what was just presented, I've been thinking there, there've been some programs where like in Connecticut, they were offering free computers, free internet service. And yet they're still not getting full take up. Um, and so I think there are a lot of issues within communities of it can be digital literacy. It can be and even computers were being offered as well. Like everything was potentially being offered and households were still not necessarily doing this. And, and there can be an issue that if households are moving frequently, then it's difficult to set up each time. Um, or households might be afraid to give out their information even if something is free or potentially free, if they're worried that something will happen later on or they might be on the hook for costs later or they're just afraid of giving their information out. So I think there are a lot of issues um, that we need to think about that are very important. And I think like what they're talking about the libraries and, and the teaching is so important because it does seem like knowing how to access is, is very important. And, and that's also, so I, in terms of the digital divide, I see it in my own research, I see it as, as two things is one is, do you find the internet relevant? And if you're 90 years old and you've never used it before, then you don't care if it's free. Even if someone paid you a buck a month, you might still not want to deal with it. Um, and so for those households, we're not going to really sh shift things much. But there are other households who do find the internet relevant and historically have relied on smartphone only access, which until COVID was pretty good. And that, you know, but then COVID changed things dramatically in the sense that uh, you might have been access, you know, you've been ha were happy with smartphone access at home because then you could go to work and access it there, or you could go to a library and access it there, or you, you know, you had access outside of the home. Um, but with COVID, you lost the outside access, and the need for uh, you know high speed and high quality really increased at home because you might be working from home. If you had children, they were. Um, going to school at home. So there, I think there was a big shift in um, relevance of internet to the home, of high-speed internet to the home for, for a, a large percent of our population who previously had been happy or like reasonably happy with smartphone. Um, and, and in fact, the Pew Research kind of shows this, that like the percentage of people who used to say smartphone access only was sufficient um, went down, I wrote this somewhere, it used to be uh, 80% in 2019. And then in 2021, in the early 2021, they were saying only 71% of those who currently did not have internet, a broadband service to the home were now saying that, um, oh, sorry, so this was that they were not interested in the internet at all, but uh, what I was saying before is still true in terms of the smartphones. So I, I think COVID has really shifted relevance, not of the internet, not relevance of broadband, but relevance of broadband to the home. And so that's create, you know, I, I don't, if someone doesn't care for a service, then I don't care if they don't have it. 
if they, you're right. I'm not going to, I don't think we have to force things upon people, but the issue is really if, if, if people have a need for it, have a desire for it, and they're still not getting it. Why is that? But in, like in the case I'm talking about Connecticut with the schooling program, it wasn't cost in the sense that they were able to have everything for free. And yet you still had a large, a very large percent who weren't signing up. And that's, that's a big problem and a big question to solve. And I think, and, and even at the end of that report, they were talking about we feel that we need more people who can actually go to the home and help them set this up. I mean, if you think if, if the parents are not educated, if they don't speak English or they're just not educated, they've never used a computer before or they don't use it frequently, it, it can be that can be a hurdle to figure out how to do this. And um, I mean, I spent all day today trying to get internet service. <laughs> and, you know, I know a fair amount about this and I really had trouble today um, to do that. So I can imagine if, if someone, you know, isn't in a profession that's regularly doing this, it's very difficult. And, and how do they do that if they're trying to set it up just for their children to go to school for the first time? So I think a lot of this one-on-one -on -one interaction and helping is very important. Yeah, and I think what we've heard from Alonzo and what we're seeing also from some of the community-led networks that we work with around the world, particularly in New York City, for example, New York City Mesh, um, there's there were a lot of um, parents who did not have connectivity at home because they couldn't afford it, or they the kids were learning um, at school and the affordability and availability was there. And I think what we're seeing from you on that on that demand side or the potential for demand and supply is that there are people that may not know enough about where to get that connectivity and they may not be able to afford it right now. I'm from Maine and there was actually um, several families in the rural area that I'm from um, who couldn't afford to have connectivity at home and they had to rejigger their finances and figure out what to do. Um, with the schools closed, it showed us that there's this role that local urban and the municipalities can play, cities, towns, states. We're really looking at what's the game changer on public private access and public access. Yeah. I think Don knows a lot about this from the Urban League. So I'm going to turn to Don right now and we'll come back um, to you, Michelle, on this one. But Don, You've got a new report out from the Urban League side, and I'm going to make sure I get this right, um, because you saw during the pandemic that there were millions affected, uh, millions of Americans affected who lost access because of the schools, their place of work, libraries, coffee shops closed, and access to broadband was limited and or not there. Um, this disproportionate um, uh, availability of access also impacted certain groups, um, African-Americans, people of color, those in rural America and low income families. And this is not new. We've seen from Larry Irving, who I used to work for at NTIA back in 92 and 97, the falling through the net reports. And Don, you're smiling, so I have a feeling you know Larry. Um, so to address the digital divide um, that we're seeing in this country and that Sonia and I see globally, um, the National Urban League developed the Lewis Latimer Plan for Digital Equity and Inclusion. Can you give us um, more information about that, share some details and recommendations to address the digital equity divide that you're seeing? Thank you so much, Jane. And, and just want to say good afternoon to all of the panelists and, and to everyone who's, who's joining us today. I apologize for being a little late, but it seems like I came in right at the right time because Michelle could have written uh, the Lewis Latimer pro program, the, the, the project, because many of the things she just talked about are, are the, the issues that we, we addressed. And you know, the National Urban League has been around since 1910. We, we serve 91 communities at, with our local affiliates. We're a civil rights organization that was developed when African-Americans were leaving the Deep South, trying to escape Jim Crow right after Reconstruction ended. And they moved up north thinking, we got to get a job. We need a school we can send our kids to, hospitals we can we can get health care, and a home. And, and that was the, the divide then. And the Urban League has been working on the divides of this country, the racial wealth gap and, and those divides 
for 111 years. Well, the most recent one that we've been able to put some attention on, all of us, is on this digital divide. And that is exactly what the Lewis Latimer Project and program was all about. It was about, it's named after an African-American inventor. And, and it was, how do we address these, these issues? And Michelle hit them literally on the point. The first one, obviously, is the availability gap, the ability to just um, have available uh, broadband that brings us into the 21st century. And as we know, especially in rural America, and I know I work for the, the, the National Urban League, but I grew up as a, a, a black boy from Southwest Louisiana in the country. I know my parents still struggle with um, availability and, 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 and access in many of our lives. American communities, we still we struggle with that, and and, and still are. That's why we're such a big supporter of the infrastructure, which is what brought Michelle to that that topic. Is that we believe that infrastructure is not just roads and bridges; it's also access uh, to the 21st century. The, the, the gap that I want to talk about the most, though, is the adoption gap, which is what Michelle talked about as well. Which is just really we look at that in two ways: one, affordability, which I'll come to, and then this digital readiness. We believe that organizations like the National Urban League and others, the libraries, we are, Michelle, you said something, it's about trust. You, you brought something up, you said we can offer. Why is it that some people are still not getting, they, and they get it, but why is it they're not buying it, right? Why are they not truly invested? And some of it is, is, is trust. It's, Having the right person, Alonzo, communicate to the people in the community why this is important for their health, their job, their future, their education, checking, paying bills. And, it, and that's why it's so important and why we stand for programs, grants, opportunities that people who know their community should be the people who are, who are saying these things to these people. And it's going to take time. It's going to be surgical because we really are trying to get to that last, those last millions of Americans to say, hey, this is good for you and we wanna make it good for you. And so we believe that there has to be a digital empowerment movement is what we call it, the National Urban League, where we actually empower people um, by teaching them the benefits of, of the digital, of digital literacy and readiness. And then the affordability, we have low cost broadband programs now, many companies offer them. People still aren't able to afford it. And it's hard for those of us who, who have means to even think, well, if your broadband is $14, can't you get it? And some people cannot. And so that's why the Urban League and the, and the, and the Latimer Project, we are big supporters of creating a permanent broadband benefit that we're asking Congress to appropriate money to the FCC to help people, to subsidize people's ability to, to, to get online. We believe that is a, a that is the way we can we can we can really it may not solve the solution, solve everything, but it is definitely a, a solution that needs to be considered. And so we have been we have used this Latimer program, this Latimer project, Jane, to not just put out a great report. And, and you have the link to it on the um, on in the chat, but we've used it to advocate. And so we are on the Hill. We're meeting with the White House. We've got our 91 affiliates. We've got all the people who who have lived this over the last year. Who are advocating and letting people know that this is um, this is a big issue, and, and I'll say this: and it's not minorities in our country. Sometimes we have people who advocate for us, and we are shut out of the advocacy. And this is an issue that we have been very clear to all communities and our white allies and our allies from all other groups. We have to. We ha we have an opportunity right now to, to to make this better. And if we don't, and we get stuck again in another pandemic or, or another crisis, we some of us may not make it out of that. And so we need to make sure that we get this right and we get it right now. And so we are at an inflection point in our country in so many ways. But even in this digital divide. And so I want to just say, and I'll stop. I want to just thank IGF for even hosting this forum. This is. This is what we need to be talking about. And we need diverse voices talking about it. And I don't just mean racially diverse, diver, diver, diverse backgrounds, libraries and, and, a kind, and, and, and experts and civil rights organizations. And so I wanna thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Don. And there's, um, there's a saying we have at the Internet Society when we're working with local communities, wherever they are, which is with the community, for the community, by the community. It doesn't matter what kind of community it is, if it's urban, rural, remote, unserved, underserved. Um, and to pick up on a point there you're making about minorities left out on the advocacy side, 
we often will go in and make sure we are not trying to speak for communities, but with them at their pace as they like. And I'm thinking of tribal communities in the United States as well, looking at the tribal priority window the FCC opened up to provide some more connectivity. Um, there are a lot of great programs going now based on tribal needs at their pace as they, as they themselves want to advocate with support from behind. So thank you for highlighting through the Latimer um, report and the work that you're doing, the importance of making sure you're not trying to speak for others when you're going out there to provide that connectivity. Um, you highlighted um, affordability, picking up on the adoption gap that Michelle mentioned and the importance of working with local people um, to get that advocacy out there. Um, advocacy is critical. We've got to raise the issues up around the planet. And there's a, a person here on the panel, that would be Sonia George from A4AI, who's doing just that um, through the great reports that A4AI has focused on universal service. I want to throw out there that we're seeing the need for hybrid financing, hybrid regulation, hybrid everything right now, because some of the old system is broken. This may not necessarily be in this country, but around the planet, we're seeing that the old universal service financing. And for organizations like A4AI, the Urban League, the libraries, the work that Michelle's doing at the university at Duke, to highlight how we can do research to address that affordability gap, highlight what needs to be done and advocate and work with others. So Sonia, over to you to give us um, a perspective on what A4AI is doing related to bringing people online and how you're addressing it um, at A4AI with your partners. Thank you, Jane. It's really great to be here. Thank you all for uh, joining. And it, it's really wonderful to hear Michelle uh, Alonso and, and Don speak about the, you know, the reality in the U.S., right, and the in different states. As you all know, probably, we focus most of our work in uh, developing countries, what we like to call low- and middle-income countries in the Global South. And as you can imagine, the situation is much dire, much more dire than it is for those of us here in the US. But there are some similarities. And the thing that is interesting is actually understanding what are those similarities, what are the same challenges, and how in different countries we've been able to or are we trying to address some of these challenges in a way that not only can we learn about them here in the US, but also make sense of them, especially around the discrepancies and inequalities that exist within communities. So just to put a little bit of perspective, uh, and some of you may know these data, but let me just share a little bit. Um, in uh, the regions of the world that we focus most of our work, Africa, Latin America, and Asia Pacific, in Africa, you have about 29% of the population online. In the Americas, you have about 77% of the population online. And in the Pacific, uh, Asia and the Pacific, you have about 45% of the population online. Now, this is very different than the situation that you have in the U.S. The other thing that is really important, in the U.S., we are about 80%, depending on which data point you're looking at, and maybe all of you can correct me on that. Um, the other thing that is important to us is understanding the different uh, gaps that exist. population online in Africa, but in fact, 85%, uh, there's an 85% gender gap, meaning that there are some people online, but most that are online, um, women are not online. And then as you break it down into different groups and different communities, rural populations are not online, poor populations are not online, and other kinds of marginalized groups. This is true across the board in different regions. Now, why is that important here to compare with the US? What we've learned, and again, to some of the points that Don was mentioning, is that there are many alternative ways in which not only we can make sure that people have access, but make sure that once they have access, they can actually benefit from the opportunity that that access provides to them, right? So I apologize. Um, so affordability is the key um, concern, and that's why we are the Alliance for Affordable Internet. We are very concerned about affordability in many respects, and we focus primarily and we work with governments, uh, private sector, and society organizations to develop policy and regulatory solutions that tackle affordability issues in a different ways. One is by overall reducing the cost structure in uh, the industry, which is really important, and it's a really big challenge, but also 
we look at how, even when there is infrastructure, how can we then have the kinds of programs then compensate either through subsidies or otherwise, the kind of traditional costs, right? That the industry insists that it has to provide connectivity. And this is why in the US, for example, we have the high cost fund and other kinds of universal access programs. Similarly, in other countries, we have those. The thing is that the magnitude of the problem is much bigger. And so even when you have, say, for example, in some regions of the world, coverage of, say, as the industry likes to say, about 80 or 90 percent coverage of 3G and 4G broadband, the reality is that a sliver of the, percent of the population actually has access to that, right? Cost is a main issue. And, and frankly, this is actually just to try to kind of keep the comparison alive here. Uh, that is also a problem in the U.S. There are some areas in the U.S. that are supposedly covered by uh, broadband networks. Um, we like to look at broadband at the kind of 4G and above. 3G, frankly, what the pandemic has shown is just not enough for the kinds of activities that people need to conduct online, right? Including schooling, healthcare, and, and business, et cetera. But... Um, the truth is there isn't, um, you know, while there is infrastructure, there, it's not affordable for people to come online. And even when it is affordable, there are those issues that many of you already highlighted, the skills, the content, the language, content in the right language, information that is relevant for the different communities. If, say, the information in a particular community, and again, this is true in other countries as it is in the U.S., if the majority of the information online is information that is not relevant for people's lives, either not relevant for them to support their family or their kids' education, or for them to have access to health information, for them to participate civically in their communities, it's not going to be relevant. So access to the internet has to be relevant in different languages with different kind of content and content that is relevant for everyone, not just to a few elite or a few that may seem to be a majority, but are not all. So all of these pieces of the puzzle need to come together. And one of the things that we've, um, a few things that I wanted to share with you, um, and I know we'll have more discussion, Jane. Um, one is that when we think about infrastructure investments, and this is an area that we uh, at AFRI have spent a lot of time thinking about not only calculating what the investments uh, needed are, but when you think about investments, we cannot neglect the investment that is needed in communities. And when I mean investment in communities, I mean investments in skills, a skill building in programs for communities, as well as the policy and regulatory kind of investments that are needed to facilitate the kind of access that is required for those communities that tend to be left um, outside of the equation. So say, for example, in many countries where we are working in Southern Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America, we've been focusing a lot on uh, making sure that spectrum policy such that uh, offers spectrum, a licensed spectrum, and spectrum in kind of the, the white uh, spaces that so rural operators, smaller operators, community networks, as Jane mentioned earlier, are able to provide access, not only at a much more affordable price, but what we've discovered is that those kinds of alternative providers are more likely to develop community programs that will come with programs to help with skills, programs and content that is relevant to the communities. Generally, uh, larger MNOs, um, mobile network providers, are not so interested in the communities at that point, at, at that level. And so it's not just about making sure that there is investment, but that the investment is one that is very specific to meeting the needs of the populations that are being left behind or outside of the opportunity, and then also making sure that the content is relevant, right? So policy is really important to support that. The Mesh Network example in New York is a good one. Jane, I don't know to what extent that particular community networks also provide skills, but I would imagine that they probably do, and they're probably connected to either libraries, schools, et cetera. So it's looking at that whole picture holistically that really makes a difference. And just to close on this point, um, 
what we uh, insist and really advocate for at the Alliance is that we don't just look at affordability, we look at affordable and meaningful connections, affordable and meaningful connectivity. And the reason why that is the case is because we cannot accept a situation where uh, you have uh, subpar connectivity or poor internet access, as there is the case in many uh, communities and in many parts of the world. And what we mean by meaningful connectivity, we mean um, access that is daily, regular, whatever people need. Um, we mean connectivity that is uh, to the right uh, data, to the right speed, the right data allowance, and also with the right device. And what that says, because we are considering also devices and affordable devices, that devices have to also be part of the equation. And that goes to the point, to the reason why interesting piece, my colleague wrote an interesting piece about the role of libraries in ensuring meaningful connectivity to different communities, not just in other parts of the world, but I would say also here in the US and IFLA has done some interesting work in that area Absolutely. and some other folks. So I'll, I'll stop there. We'll come back to, to these again, but hopefully this gives you a bit of a broader picture of how we look at the question. Thank you, Sonia, because you've given us that great global perspective, which is back to um, also can be at our local level. Michelle, we've seen um, the fact that, yes, things may not be affordable in certain places. There may need more skills. You wanted to come back to this. So I'm going to start with you, Michelle. But I want to sort of pivot the conversation a little bit and ask this question about the importance of um, affordability and startup financing or subsidies. Because let's be frank, some projects can't get off the ground without a little bit of help. Um, for example, the CARES Act, putting money into um, libraries to help them start up. There are some folks that we work with around the world that say no startup funding, no subsidies. But let's be frank, every, uh, everywhere around the world, there are subsidies, whether they're for network infrastructure or therefore some of the grants that we give some of the community networks to get started because they may not have that liquidity in their own market. So here's the question. What do you think about more public spending for startup for equity and inclusion training and for say libraries to go out to the communities? So help us there from the economics. And I'm gonna start with Michelle, go over to Don, hop over to Alonzo and then come back to Sonia because sometimes we're seeing the need for a little bit of startup funding. Companies have startup funding, why not nonprofits, libraries and others? So what's your perspective on this, um, Michelle? It'd be really great to hear from you. Okay, so I will address that, but before I, I kind of, um, an attendee made a good point that I was being un, not careful with some of my language, but I feel like right now, um, your question is a little not careful in its language because we've been talking about many, many issues and you keep referring, you keep saying that this is all having to do with the affordability gap. And I think that a lot of what we're talking about is affordability is really a very, very small component of what's driving the gap, at least in the United States. Now, I would totally agree in developing nations, that's a, a completely different story. But uh, there's work by Wallstein, uh, Rostin and Walston, who have really showed that even when you're, you know, it, so I, I have an issue, I take issue with the term affordability gap. The other thing That's I want true. to take issue with is uh, then you said, well, then we need to, you know, the community needs to do things. And I agree, the community needs to do things in terms of helping with digital literacy, helping to, sh to, to show relevance and things like that. However, um, recent or work I'm currently doing right now with a co-author, we've been looking at municipal internet service provision and cooperative internet service provision. Um, and we were looking at uh, the state of Illinois at the census block level. We are limited in sense we're using FCC data, which is not very granular. It's kind of an all or nothing for a census block, but still pretty good. And one thing that we found, we're looking from June of 2016 to June of 2018. And we're looking at the probability of entry of uh, an internet service provider during that time period. What we discovered is that while incumbents generally lead to more entry in the future, you know, probably because these are 
good markets and we're controlling for you know market factors the demographics and all those things the income the geography all those things so while incumbents generally lead to higher probabilities of further entry by internet service providers if an incumbent happens to be a municipality it lowers the likelihood of a new entrant by 72% relative to if the incumbent was were not a muni. And if the incumbent is a cooperative internet service provider, it lowers it by 87%. So, and, and there's some real reasons to understand that. And a lot of those are regulatory um, because municipal, um, co- uh, municipal utilities and cooperative utilities have uh, differential treatments and have differential abilities to impact competition. And so we had been looking at that to see how the presence of these organizations impacted continued investment, continued entry and continued investment. And the fact that we see such a huge decrease in the likelihood of any other provider wanting to go into that area is a really strong indicator that those are not the providers that we want to be with our new regulations or our new subsidies, we should not be prioritizing groups that seem to have a negative effect on investment locally. Um, I'm not saying to, 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 to harm them, but, but there's, there's a real problem with me is the idea of saying, oh, no, these are the way we're gonna help. Also because municipal ISPs are not in the areas that we're worried about the digital divides. The municipal ISPs were actually in higher income areas and more urban areas. They're not rural on average, at least in Illinois, when we looked at this, they were on average in areas with higher income levels than a regular service provider. So the idea of looking to municipalities and giving them money to try and solve the digital divide is is kind of a non-starter because they're not even in the area, the big areas where they, that's really the big issue. Um, and most of the time, they're not the first entrant. Oh, thank you for that, um, Michelle. And, and perhaps I misspoke because um, the work that we do in many here, it's, it's not just affordability, of course, it's access. So there's a reason there are the words unserved and underserved in the uh, universal service language and the ones that we all use wherever we're working around the world. You've brought up some really interesting points and we've seen a differential in some of that. If you're talking about tribal communities where there are community led networks because of the tribal um, sovereignty issues, but also in certain urban, rural, remote areas, there is this access gap, right? So um, with respect to the infrastructure itself and the affordability of that infrastructure, um, we also know there are certain companies that don't get a return on investment for serving certain populations under, say, 5,000. We've learned that from GSMA for the MNOs. Um, But that also means that there's a way for the public space to work with the private space, whether it's PPP or whether it's investment in public backbones. Um, I'm going to turn to Don uh, and then Alonzo, sorry, and Sonia. Don, what are, you, what are you seeing with respect to both the affordability and the access gap? If we're trying to get 100% of the population online, and we also know from the World Bank and other financial institutions that more connectivity equals stronger socioeconomic development. So talk to us about that from the Urban League's perspective. The Urban League's perspective is we need to focus deployment dollars in places that have no broadband access today. And I know that's a very complicated issue and and um, we get caught up in, in, in the technicalities of it. And I get it. But that is where we are. Let, let us find the best ways to deploy in places that don't have it. And as you said, Jane, a lot of those places right now uh, is, are rural areas. I mean, a, a lot of the folks who we, we serve in the National Urban League in the cities of America, the argument would be made. They absolutely have access. They absolutely have access to high speed broadband. And so then we go to the next issue, which is, again, um, how do we pay for it? Right. How do you afford it? And and so, again, we believe that the solution is a permanent broadband benefit like SNAP, uh, where we subsidize and we give people a benefit who cannot afford even the low cost programs that are out there. We give them an opportunity to participate in the new economy. And and I look forward to the day, ladies and gentlemen, where we're not just talking about access, we're talking about empowerment 
by the by by broadband by connectivity where we're talking about businesses and and being able to bring opportunities to people who never would have been able to dream of these opportunities. Like, I feel like we have a tone here today and I get it. We're still in a pandemic and our country, especially is an inflection of a lot of things. Trust me, as a civil rights worker, I wake up every day, but we should also be talking about the power of it, the, of, of connectivity and the positive of it once we get it to, to everyone. And so I don't want us to, to go down a, 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 ro- a rabbit hole of it's, we have done some good things too. And there are a lot of people connected and we know we got to do better. And let's do it. And let's make sure we give people that access they do. And then the third thing is, and once we do, let, let's bring organizations in that people trust. I do believe in government being able to grant organizations, libraries, schools, helping people of all ages feel comfortable, giving people incentives with equipment to make sure that they can learn how to do it. Again, this may be the time, this is the one revolution that all Americans get to participate in. Most of us couldn't participate in in the agricultural revolution. We were enslaved. The industrial revolution missed many of us, immigrants who were not here and African-Americans, Jim Crow stopped us from doing that. This is a revolution, if we do it right, for the entire country, the entire world, that everybody can participate. And so I just hope that we will, yes, as we work through the nuances, and, and God knows there are a lot of them, that we will see the benefit of the bright side of it. Now, I will say this. I left the Urban League two years ago, and I went to a telecommunications company, and I'm back at the Urban League. And I want to say this because uh, this never gets said. I do see a sense because I've been on both sides of the issue in some ways. I absolutely do see some communication, no pun intended, between industry and civil rights that did not exist years ago. It's not that they weren't talking, but there were certain issues they were not going to be on the same side of. And I am happy to see that we are working through some tough issues that I never in a million years thought we were going to be able to work through. So there are there's some good news in this space. And and I hope that we can continue to work together. And again, I said this, that's why these panels are important. And I'm watching the chats. I, I love the chats and a lot of experts in the chat. I can see that, too. A lot of people who know this issue a lot better than me, but I will say. Every day we wake up, the people on this panel, we wake up to to make people's lives better. But let's not just have a negative tone on this panel. I don't want us to leave here and say, this is the word, this is terrible. And it's, no, we've got work to do. We've made a lot of progress. um, And we can get there if we work together and we come up with some good common sense, trustworthy programs that that bring us to the last group of millions of people who need this in, in America. And thank you for that word, trust on and the empowerment. Um, Absolutely. And this is something that we all do wake up every day and we want to connect people. We want to make sure businesses thrive. We want to make sure uh, communities have what they have. Um, From the library side, Alonzo, um, Don and Michelle and Sonia have been talking about different ways that we can look at bridging accessibility, affordability gaps, empowering communities, trust, business connectivity. You're, you're at that local level. You're a trusted person in the community. What did you do during COVID that was different? Um, perhaps to build more trust because people were in a different situation. It was a complicated time. Um, and what have you seen from that trust side with the library as the library seen as a trusted entity? And was that transferred to you as a person going out into the community? Give us a little bit more on that. Yeah. So, you know, and I, and I really appreciate that, you know, these, these kind of um, this theme is kind of showing up about trust, about accessibility, about affordability um, and about relevance. Right. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, M- Michelle made a comment about affordability and, you know, that, that maybe that's not the biggest, the bigger issue, but, you know, I think it depends, you know, there, there's communities that, that I work in that I, that I've, you know, gone out and done outreach in that you literally cross the street and you're in a very different world. Um, you know, so we have these really rich, really affluent neighborhoods, you know, affluent families of people that have had money for generations. situation and scenario and so those folks have accessibility because the infrastructure is there but again we go back to affordability you know and, and there is those, those real studies those, those situations where like even with our tech lending program where we have it and it's free and you know and i'm gonna to Multnomah County libraries horn a little bit because it's not only free but there is no fees if devices are damaged or not returned or you know just broken um you know, and, and whereas other libraries there, there's like a contract you have to sign. And if, 
gets returned broken or not in working order, then you got to pay for the device. So we don't have that. And so I'm kind of really proud of MCL for that. But even so, you know, there's areas that can have connectivity, but again, can't afford it. And nice program like, you know, uh, Comcast Internet Essentials program, which is like $10 a month. It's not sufficient. If you got three kids in school trying to use that connection, it's not going to work for them. And so the affordability still is real. It's still an issue for many families, for many individuals. Um, but the other piece of, of trust and accessibility, like, you know, it, it, it's a challenge. We, we have, you know, I had, had mentioned 500 hotspots, 500 um, Chromebooks, and we're down to about 140. So we've lent out the majority of them, trying to get these others lent out. And some of the conversations that I have, it is around trust. It's, you know, well, you're a government agency. You're, the, you're part of the county. I don't know that I could trust the county. What are you going to do with my information? Are you going to give my information to immigration? You know, are immigration going to find out that I'm accessing these resources? And if they do, what does that mean for my citizen app, citizenship application, right? So there's real fears and real concerns and real questions. And so, you know, a lot of it is just the reassurance, the patience, you know, being able to connect with people in a culturally responsive way, in a linguistically responsive way. So having people that represent those communities, that live in those communities, that reflect those communities, to provide those resources, to answer those questions, you know, to be the representative that's connecting with them. And that consistency, to have that same person be able to show up multiple times in a month and say, oh, you know what? Oh, there goes Alonso again. Like, I know him. Like, yeah, we could trust him. He's, you know, he's a, a trust, you know, worthy person. So, you know, all those things kind of come into play when we're trying to connect people to these acts, to these resources that are free, um, you know, because it is true. You could have free resources, but are people going to take on, you know, take them on? And sometimes no. But again, it depends on the work that's being put into the, 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 what kind of investment are you making into those relationships? Are you building community? Are you establishing those connections and making people feel that like, yes, this is a, this is a trustworthy program. This is a trustworthy person. You know, so what, what's, what work is being done there? And, you know, and part of it, I think is, you know, what the effort that we're making to be out in the community. So taking our services and moving them away from the building itself. You know, we're not just a building, right? We're, we're a real resource. We are here to serve you. And so trying to make that connection and trying to build that trust. Um, and in terms of, of, you know, startups and, you know, financing and yeah, I, I think there needs to be that, you know, we definitely had, we have bailout for banks, you know, we should have bailout for community members. We should have that financial support for community members. I, I feel that like with municipal, so in Multnomah County, we did a municipal broadband feasibility uh, survey. And there's some good information that came out of that. I, I could maybe drop the link in the chat. Um, but basically there, there's, there's a place where, you know, if we have municipal broadband, we can make the market, the market a little bit more competitive. And even though there's, you know, like as Michelle was commenting, there, there's like these rich neighborhoods that get these, this resource, this service, this infrastructure. But again, crossing the street, there's that community that is not rich, that they're not wealthy. They don't have, you know, they're not making over $100,000 a year. They're making $20,000 a year. And so then, you know, that infrastructure, that municipal broadband can be very beneficial to those families and to those individuals. Another thing that we've been doing at the library is connecting with our houses population. So there's encampments, you know, that people have organized and created, you know, little um, kind of residential areas, but, but they're campsites. They're, they're, you know, people living in tents. And we've been going out into those communities and providing mobile Wi-Fi, providing, you know, computer access. And again, you know, how would mobile broadband benefit those communities? Well, greatly, right? And it's a challenge. It's not easy. There's, there's a lot of work ahead of us. But as Donald was saying, and I really appreciate the, the energy there, you know, this is empowering. And this is a moment where, like, you know, we could change the narrative. We could completely shift and make this a whole different world for, for many people. And that's the excitement that I have. That's the excitement I come to work with every day to try to do more, to try to be better, you know, look at what we have, look at it with an equity lens and say, okay, how do we improve? How do we grow? One needs to change. Being very honest and being very critical about what we're doing, how we're doing it, and who we're serving. Thank you for that, Alonso. And shifting the narrative is really critical. And we do have Sonia in the queue. Um, and then we'll come back around through Michelle, Don, Alonso, and Sonia. But it really is important to, um, we kind of need that empowering narrative 
which will help the broadband be accessible to all, right? And so the accessibility, the affordability, the local drivers are different for each community. Um, you've got to know what those drivers are. And Don, you've seen this from the Urban League side, Alonzo in the field, Michelle with the research you're doing and the work you've done. Um, Sonia, talk to us about that trust factor, the empowerment and how you shift change and how you create a different narrative because you've been doing that with a for ai to bring that excitement to the regulators and policymakers I know you're working with and the people in the field. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, no, I was listening to, to Don and I was like, well, Don, I wish you could come and join our work in Nigeria and Ghana in Mozambique in Bangladesh and the Dominican Republic, et cetera. Because that's exactly what uh, we're doing with communities. In fact, the, the, the way that we work in all of these countries is that we establish coalitions of all the different stakeholders, public, private, civil society. And civil society actors are not only super active, but they are fighters, right? They're fighters for equality. They're fighters for um, equity. And, you know, really trying to address a lot of the gaps that exist in all of the different uh, communities and we work at both within a country at the very local level uh, and then national level in some countries that are large as the U.S. like Nigeria at the state level and what happens is that yes those communities are not only very active but they're there and they want to design policy and regulatory frameworks because they see the importance to empowering the communities. It's all about empowerment. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, we do so much work also on the gender gaps and on the urban gaps and different kinds of communities because um, the goal here is not just to make access for the sake of access or invest in infrastructure for the sake of infrastructure, but to make sure that it's useful, that it provides an opportunity to anyone so that people can use it however they want However, they determine that they have the agency to determine their own use and, and put it to practice. And that's really important to us. I mean, this is why when we talk about affordability, you cannot, we cannot um, diminish the importance of affordability because if people cannot afford, that's the first barrier, right? But even when they can afford, if they cannot do other things that they need to do, then it's also a barrier. So we need to look at the whole package. And so some of you already mentioned a couple of things here that I just want to highlight from the numbers that I have that I think we collected like late last year. In the U.S., only about 70, 73 percent of the population, according to Pew and Michelle, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, have enough data. That means that many communities, many individuals, many organizations, even if they can access the kind or afford the kind of access that they have is not good enough. It's not going to be enough to, for productive activities, for civic activities, for civic participation, and for the kinds of empowering opportunities that good data, good speed will provide. So all of these things come together. Same with uh, devices, you know, in the U.S., you know, it's the country that has one of the smartphones, I think about 80% at the moment, but are smartphones enough? As all of you pointed out, I mean, what the pandemic has shown is that, well, maybe in the pre-pandemic world where a lot of things were taking place elsewhere, you know, libraries were actually a lifeline for many people. They may have smartphones, but then they go to the library when they need to use a computer or a tablet or what have you. I mean, my kids' schools here in Boston, half of the kids have uh, borrowed devices, have subsidies to make sure that at home they also have connectivity. That's wrong, right? That's because, you know, the market and the policy setup that we have is not delivering on what we want universal access to look like. Universal access is not about creating those differences and um, benefiting from inequalities, it is the opposite. It's actually taking away those inequalities and making sure that everybody is at the same level playing field. And that's why for us affordable and meaningful connectivity is so important. So you have to look at all of those things. In uh, countries in the global south, where we work primarily, there's different ways again that uh, these things have been done. Libraries, sadly, Alonso, are not as widespread in many countries as we wish, but in some countries they are. Most countries, community centers, um, 
you know, even schools become kind of community centers because they really are kind of a magnet and for institutions where a lot happens, local governments as well. In fact, we working with um, our colleagues at USAID and the government of Kenya now to help them um, devise a program to invest uh, in public institutions, primarily schools in three of the poorest counties of the country. Why? Because those counties uh, in the country have been completely left out of everything due to conflict, due to poverty, and people will not be able to even consider the power of connection or the power of access to information as a basic tool for civic participation unless they have access to it. So bringing all of these pieces together for us, it's really important. And yes, Jenny, it may, may appear that sometimes you know, you have to deal with the access piece and you deal with that. Other times you have to look at the content piece and the language piece. Other times you have to look at the skills piece because the access is there. But it's bringing all of these together that makes sense. And it's only when all of the pieces of the puzzle have been addressed that people can fully benefit not just from the digital opportunity, as we like to say, but also very importantly, that empowerment opportunity that Dawn was talking about. Um, otherwise, you know, people remain uh, left out and they can't participate. And that's exactly the kind of picture that we're trying to uh, change. Uh, Jenny, if I'm allowed just one uh, second to answer. Ten minutes All left. We've got ten okay. minutes left, so I do just want to make sure I wrap it up. Just one that someone was mentioning yep. about the the Connecting Humanity report, just to clarify what that was about. This was an attempt to try to estimate if we were to bring the world to have a basic access, which we consider in this case equivalent to 4G connectivity everywhere in the world, with a caveat that universal access, as I put on the chat, is 90% of the population of 10 years and older. And the, that was very specific. Uh, I can tell you more about that if you want, but it was there was a, a specific need to define the kind of target population in that way. But the 428 billion that, as you pointed out also on the chat, is not very much. In fact, I like to say, to sound provocative, that 428 billion from now until 2030 to bring the rest of the world to that point of universal access is about as much as we spend on soda every year in the world. So the amount of money that we spend on soda, it would be enough to bring the world to a 4G type connection by 2030. That's the magnitude of the problem, but it's also how you know, doable it is, right? And imagine the possibilities that that would do because that comes with skills and content and all of that. So I would want to provoke you to think a little bit out of the box when it comes to affordability and access and think about, yes, the opportunities, because that's exactly what we want to get to. But yes. I'll stop there. Okay. We have about nine minutes left. And so I want to give everybody an opportunity, each of you. One minute each, we're going to go quickly on what you think the key drivers are for getting people online. So I'm going to start with Michelle. I'm going to move to Don, Alonzo, Sonia. So give me a minute, Michelle, and I'll come back around to you. Uh, one minute on where you think some of the key things are to get 100% of the Americans connected or, Sonia, globally people connected. So Michelle, over to you for a minute. All right, I always want to answer a slightly different question, but um, it's- Push out I, what you want to so, push out. <laughs> so, Sonia, I think it was exactly right. You want the bang for your buck. You want to figure out where you're going to get value. And, and, and so this is where it's, you have to target what, what is, and this is why I keep saying, what is the question? So if the question is affordability because of lack of income, then you want to target the money at helping low income families. If the issue, is infrastructure, then you want to target infrastructure. But that's exactly the reason why, Alfonso, I love what you're doing, but I would disagree. If you already have an internet service provider, why would you spend billions of dollars to get a second one in where there's already availability, accessibility? You want to, you know, the issue, if you already have a provider is, you know, is on the household side, not on the provision side. And, and the point about my research was that the, the 
and what is called the additional competition from the municipality actually lowers competition because then we see less further entry and we also saw less speed, lower speed. So the communities that had the muni stuff had less entry and less speed because the existing ISPs won't invest as much in quality when their competitor is the muni. So, so this idea that you want to everywhere bring in an extra competitor through muni subsidization, it's actually counterproductive. Now, if there's no service at all, but the universal service fund and all these grants are for unserved and underserved. And then yes, like if someone wants to come in and they want to get these things, absolutely. But you, you want to spend your money wisely. Okay. Thank you. Minutes up. Don, over to you. Three ways. Um, a former politician, I was always taught to go in three. So three ways, the fastest way we can get Americans online. Threefold. One, focus deployment on areas that have no access to bro broadband today. Two, establish a permanent broadband benefit. Like I said, similar to SNAP, we have programs in place. We don't have to recreate the wheel. We can do this. Closes the affordability and allows low income families to, to participate and to, to decide what connectivity needs they have and, and, and allows them to meet those needs. Lastly, we talked about this. It's about digital education, literacy, readiness, trust, getting people to feel safe in the safe space and letting and, and helping them understand the benefits of being connected. I hope, and, and this is what I think real equity is. We, we talk about equity. And I know that's not what this panel is about, but real equity for me would be everybody's connected. And then we'd be, be talking about people of color and women and others, small businesses participating in the connectivity, in the broadband economy. We never even talk about people of color owning networks and owning these the, 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 the economic engines that will come from this. And so I can't wait to get to that discussion. That'll be another panel. But um, those are my three ways to get us connected and get us connected quickly. Awesome. Okay, Alonzo, over to you. Thank you, Michelle, and th thank you, Jane, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. And you know, Michelle, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and 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 I'm sure that the research shows that. But research also shows like the how competitive markets work, right? And so when there's more competitors, yes, prices can go down. But now, what companies choose to do when another competitor, in, you know, is introduced to the market, that's something that maybe policy can help with, right? Because if they're going to like lower speeds and you know pull some kind of sneaky trick like that, then yeah, then we need to look at, well, what else can we do to support you know, people, consumers, so that that doesn't happen to them? Um, I mean, even with the EBB that we currently have, you know, we've seen that some of the ISPs are like only applying that to like the most, the, the very most economical plans and not to their high tier plans. You know, so again, you know, how do we create policy to be able to support a very, um, I don't know, a better program, right? Better programs, better internet. But in terms of the things that could bring 100% uh, connectivity, you know, I, I think Donald said it, you know, it's education, digital literacy, you know, also relevancy. How do we make this relevant to people in their lives? You know, for older folks, for, you know, a lot of like Mexicanos, a lot of my family that, you know, they're just like, nah, yo no necesito eso. I don't need that. You know, like, no, but you do. And let me show you how, you know, let me show you the relevance of it. Um, providing that training, that accessibility, that, that education, I think is some of the key points. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, Sonia, over to you. And then I will wrap it up because I realize we have three minutes now. So Sonia, okay. a minute for you. Great. So first and foremost, for uh, those countries that we focus on, it's all about partnerships and investments. Um, it's more than clear to us that, first of all, competition alone is never going to let us there. Market forces alone are never going to get us there. We need a lot more and we need investments that are especially partnerships of public and private sector and much greater partnerships. Um, so to give you an idea, development aid organizations and international financial institutions uh, invest only about one to 2% of their resources in digital infrastructure. That's nothing, that's peanuts. If we live in a digital society, a digital economy, you need much greater amounts of investments to make sure that the masses of people that are unconnected, which is 50% of the world is still not connected, are connected. Then I think we need to change the paradigm and think about digital citizens. Digital citizens come with um, digital skills, have the education, but also understand their rights as citizens, not just to be participants in civic uh, life, but also to demand 
their, their rights of privacy, data protection, et cetera, come with the usage of a digital opportunity. So to me, to change the, the discourse uh, and to start thinking about digital citizenship is absolutely critical. And last but not least, we need leaders that think about the public interest. We just don't have enough of them. Uh, you know, we, digital development and access to the internet is a public good, is a basic right. If we don't think about it that way, and if leaders don't have the, the nerve, the, the guts to do it in that way, sorry for the That's the okay. Language. We got 30 seconds We're left. We're not going to get here. <laughs> so public interest, yeah. public interest. Thank you, Sonia. Across this panel, we've had an excellent debate and uh, um, information that we've gotten from everybody here, from Michelle to Sonia to Alonzo to Don. Thank you so much. We've talked about the importance of access, broadband benefits, education, training, partnership, investment, market forces, and um, the importance of some intervention in the market when we need it or we don't. Um, Michelle's doing great research on this. Sonia's organization does as well, as does Don's and Alonzo out in the field. Thank you very much. This has been an excellent panel with some great perspectives. We look forward to your work and stay in touch with Dustin so that your reports can get out there more and more out into the, the public. And again, from the Internet Society's perspective, this was fabulous. And thank you very much. And thank you to IGF USA. We are on time. Excellent.